Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff with Mississippi and the Civil War. Uh, sorry it's taken me so long to uh, get another episode out, but uh, the holidays being what they are, I've been uh, a little uh, preoccupied of late. But uh, I did want to try and get this episode out because it's one I've been working on for a while. And uh, I really like telling you know, first-person accounts of, uh, of battles in which Mississippians or Mississippi uh, figures because uh, I think that's really how you, you gain an understanding of, of uh, what the, the Civil War experience was like. And uh, the uh, account I'm going to be talking about tonight is rather unique. Now, I'm going to be talking about uh, an account that takes place during the Siege of Vicksburg. But um, accounts of the Siege of Vicksburg are pretty common. Uh, there were thousands of soldiers uh, on uh, both sides, both Union and Confederate that left uh, letters, diaries, reminiscences, uh, so they're, they're very readily found. But uh, tonight's uh, um, account is rather unique, and that's because it is an account by a Union civilian during the Siege of Vicksburg. And these are rather uncommon. Um, there were not a lot of uh, Union civilians that were willing to risk uh, uh, coming to Vicksburg uh, while the siege was going on. It was a rather unhealthy place for civilians. But uh, this uh, civilian that I'm going to be talking about tonight, his name was Phineas Lawrence Underwood, who was a merchant from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, he made the trip to Vicksburg while the siege was underway. And more importantly, he wrote a very long and detailed account of what he experienced during the siege. And I think this is important because a lot of what you get from soldiers' accounts of the Siege of Vicksburg, um, I think they left a lot out. Um, a lot of the, the life of a soldier was pretty boring, um, and a lot of things never got recorded. And uh, when you have a civilian account, they're going to see things differently, and you're going to get a quite different uh, uh, interpretation of events than you would from a soldier. And uh, it's for this reason that I really think this account by uh, Underwood is a very important part of the historical record. And first I need to give you a little bit of background on uh, Phineas Underwood. And he was born uh, on May 2nd, 1836 in Harwich, Massachusetts. Uh, he was one of nine children of Nathan and Rebecca Underwood. Uh, he never had much formal education. Uh, in his obituary, uh, it was said uh, that, uh, quote, what meager education Phineas got was by attending night school in the winter months near his home. When 17 years old, he moved west to Burlington, Iowa, and became partners in a wholesale grocery store. In 1856, he moved to Chicago, Illinois, which he would call home for the rest of his life. And once he arrived in Chicago, uh, he went into the commission business, and he became a member of the Chicago Board of Trade when it was first organized. Uh, by the early 1860s, uh, Phineas had been joined in his commission business by his younger bro brother Benjamin and by his cousin Sidney, operating under the name Underwood & Company, uh, General Commission Merchants, uh, on uh, South Water Street. And uh, this illustration here is a uh, good example of what... Uh, South Water Street would have looked like at the time. It was a, a you know a bustling uh, commercial center in the the city of Chicago. Phineas Underwood very quickly after he arrived in Chicago got involved with a lot of civic organizations. Uh, he felt the need to to try and improve his his new uh, new home. Uh, and one of the, the organizations he got involved with was the uh, Young Men's uh, Christian Association, the YMCA. Uh, it had been founded in London in 1844, and the goal of the organization was, quote, the spiritual and mental improvement of young men by any means in accordance with the scriptures. And on March 22nd, 1858, uh, Chicagoans again gathered uh, in an attempt to form a YMCA. After a series of meetings, a constitution was written, and the first YMCA of Chicago was officially uh, born. And the YMCA soon uh, established itself as an important part of Chicago's growing metropolitan area. In the 1860s and then in, on into the 1870s, it proved uh, an important time for the Y uh, as it departed from its initial mission of helping young men uh, and uh, began more evangelical work. 
Uh, Underswood soon found himself in a leadership position uh, in the YMCA, serving first as vice president of the Chicago branch uh, of the organization by 1861. Now, the, the YMCA was going to take on a new mission uh, uh, very shortly with the coming of the Civil War. <clears throat> On April 12, 1861, uh, the Civil War began uh, with the Confederate firing on Fort uh, Sumter in Charleston Harbor. And later that summer, uh, Underwood published the following message in the Chicago Tribune of July 3, 1861. And it said, uh, Union Prayer Meeting on the 4th. The Young Men's Christian Association will hold a prayer meeting in Bryan Hall on the 4th at 3 o'clock p.m. to pray for our Congress, which assembles on that day, that our legislators may be guided by wisdom from above in meeting the crisis that is upon the country. All pastors in the city are hereby invited to take seats on the platform. P.L. Underwood, Vice President. And... Just days after the firing on Fort Sumter, the patriotic businessmen of Chicago held a meeting at Bryan Hall <clears throat> to encourage enlistment in the Army and to encourage financial support for the troops that Illinois was going to be sending into the field. A committee from the Chicago Board of Trade uh, was uh, appointed to attend this meeting, and among uh, the men that were chosen uh, was uh, P.L. Underwood. Uh, the young businessman uh, was also appointed by his fellow citizens to be part of a group known as uh, the Committee of 30 that was to, quote, take measures to aid in sustaining the war and provide for the support of the families of soldiers in this city. And uh, they put their money where their mouth was. By August 1861, this group announced that it had raised $38,000 uh, for, quote, war purposes and the support of families. And the report went on to say that, quote, the committee now have on hand a payroll uh, of about 175 families for support of an average weekly expense of from $400 to $500, that there are many applicants for aid by women whose husbands have been uh, left them utterly destitute, that the entire available funds, if appropriated wholly to the support of families, would not last many weeks. So they really were doing some important work in helping to support the families uh, whose uh, uh, menfolk had gone off to uh, fight uh, for the Union. And by 1862, <clears throat> it was apparent to just about everyone that the war was going to be a long one. It was not going to be over quickly. And more troops were going to be needed by the Union Army uh, if they were going to bring the conflict to a successful conclusion. The Chicago Board of Trade was very strongly pro-war, and uh, they uh, were not adverse to using their financial resources to help support uh, the Illinois regiments in the field. And uh, in fact, they even went so far as to sponsor a number of re Illinois regiments and help to, uh, to form them. And among the units that they helped to sponsor was the 72nd Illinois Infantry, also known appropriately enough as the Board of Trade Regiment. Uh, one of the companies of the 72nd Illinois was known as the Fuller Guards, and uh, they were soon to be designated Company D of the regiment. Uh, the firm of Underwood and Company uh, were also sponsors of the 72nd Illinois, uh, but their aid went beyond the financial. Uh, Benjamin Winslow Underwood and Nathan Carroll Underwood, the younger brothers of Phineas, both enlisted in the Fuller Guards as lieutenants in August 1862. Uh, in an article, article published in the Chicago Tribune of August 6, 1862, it was said of the Fuller Guards, uh, uh, Messrs. Underwood and Company are the patrons of the of the company. The two junior members of the firm having enlisted, the senior, Mr. P. L. Underwood, assists them in getting together a company and providing for them using the front part of the store, 187 South Water Street, opposite the Board of Trade Rooms for a recruiting office. Between 30 and 40 more good men are wanted to make the company 100 strong. So uh, Phineas Underwood had very good reason to uh, to help uh, support uh, the 72nd Illinois and to follow its uh, actions in the field very closely as his own uh, younger brothers were uh, officers in the regiment. Uh, 
The 72nd Illinois left uh, their home state in September of 1862, and they would see uh, light action as skirmishers uh, in a number of expeditions in Kentucky and Missouri in uh, 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 in the, the months that followed. In November 1862, uh, they were transferred to Mississippi. They took part in Grant's Central Mississippi Campaign. In 1863, they took part in the Yazoo Pass Expedition, operations against Forts Pemberton and Greenwood, and then they fought at Champion Hill on May 16, 1863. Uh, after the successful Battle of uh, Champion Hill and then the next day the successful uh, Union victory at uh, the Big Black River, uh, they, the regiment along with the rest of the Union Army moved into position to help besiege the city of Vicksburg. Uh, during the siege, uh, the 72nd Illinois was part of the <coughs> 2nd Brigade, 6th Division, 17th Army Corps. Uh, the 72nd uh, Illinois was commanded by Colonel Frederick A. Starring. This is him in the upper right-hand corner here. Uh, their brigade was commanded by Brigadier General Thomas E.G. Ransom. And in addition to the 72nd Illinois, their brigade included the 11th Illinois Infantry, the 95th Illinois Infantry, uh, the 14th Wisconsin Infantry, and the 17th Wisconsin Infantry. All good Western units. Uh, during this time, uh, the Board of Trade uh, back home in Illinois was working very diligently to make sure that uh, the regiments they had sponsored uh, were receiving needed supplies in the field. And in fact, they established the Board of Trade Vicksburg Relief Committee, of which uh, Phineas Underwood was secretary. And in March 1863, the group raised over $3,000 to buy fresh fruits and vegetables uh, for the men and have them shipped to them in the field. And then after the uh, Siege of Vicksburg got underway in May 1863, the Chicago Board of Trade uh, made plans to send another shipment of supplies to the regiments they were sponsoring. And they decided uh, that one of their own members should go along just to make sure that these goods got to their intended recipients. And uh, Phineas uh, Underwood volunteered to make the journey. I think he was uh, very anxious about uh, his brothers. Uh, he hadn't heard from them. He knew they were probably under fire uh, uh, during the siege. And uh, he also had to wonder if they had perhaps been wounded or even killed in the battles leading up to the siege of Vicksburg. And I have to imagine for a family member, just that not knowing had to be just a terrible thing. So when he was offered the opportunity, he took it. And after his uh, mission to Vicksburg was completed, uh, while he was on his way back home on the steamer Hiawatha, he composed uh, the following letter uh, and wrote it to another brother, William. And uh, it's all about, uh, it's, it's just a very long account of what happened to him on this journey that he had taken to Vicksburg. The letter's dated June 12th, 1863. And, uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna read this letter to you, and uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I have, because it really is a it's an eye-opening uh, account of the siege by someone uh, that you wouldn't normally uh, uh, get this kind of uh, of firsthand account from. And the 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 letter starts, dear brother William, I am now homeward bound from a trip to the seat of war. It may not be uninteresting to you to know something of my journey and the incidents of travel to and around this point where centers for the time being a nation's interest. The shaking of the old boat will hardly enable me to write legibly like many a regiment of soldiers. I am returning under rather di different circumstances. This boat has been down here in government employ for six months and is pretty well used up so that her progress is slow. Her accommodations miserable and her fare hard, but when I reflect that unlike the soldiers who are returning maimed in, in life and limb, uh, some such passengers with us, if ever I reach home, my hardships are over. I can put up with anything. I tell you this trip has made me feel that I can be, never be thankful enough for a quiet, peaceable home when I see what our brave soldiers have suffered and are enduring to secure me that home and what the inhabitants have suffered who have had the war brought into their midst. Many of them, to be sure, enduring a righteous punishment for their part in stimulating this wicked rebellion. 
Their sins have overtaken them, and it makes me wish to inquire of myself what sins I have and what great public sins we have in the north that we may put them away before the wrath of an avenging providence may overtake us. And you know, for someone who didn't have a much formal education, Phineas Underwood really had a way with words. He he was a a a good writer. Uh, he, I think he may have missed his calling. He should have been a newspaperman or a novelist. He, he really can turn a phrase. <clears throat> but the, the letter continues, But I am not telling you about my trip. If I can succeed in picturing to your mind some of the incidents of my journey and my stay in the rear of Vicksburg as they appeared to me, you will have food for reflection enough, and therefore will not thank me for taking up our time with my thoughts. Well, on the 24th Ulto uh, Sunday, we heard in Chicago of the great successes of Grant's army, which had been uh, given them a position in rear of Vicksburg, for which the general had been planning and trying for so many months. On Monday, it was confirmed with the intelligence that several battles had been fought, and probably more would be before the final victory was ours. The Sanitary Commission set about immediately to purchase stores in abundance for the sick and wounded as our 1st and 3rd Board of Trade Regiments, the 72nd and 113th, were both in the, that vicinity, our War Committee, of which I am one, also commenced getting together sanitary stores. It was reported that uh, they were not in the fight, but we thought they might be, and, and we wherefore determined to send a man with them with supplies such as might be needed whether or not they had been in battle, and I was looking for a man to go. My business being such that I thought it impossible to leave home, Tuesday noon, the 21st, I received a telegraph from Lieutenant Colonel J.C. Wright of the 72nd, directing, uh, directed to his wife, saying that he had lost an arm. Then I knew that one of our regiments had been in the battle, and that one in which our brother and cousin, and knowing not one but they with so many others, might be suffering with their wounds in that hot climate, my business shrunk into insignificance, and I prepared to leave that evening, taking with me about sixty large boxes and barrels of goods. And then the letter picks up uh, after he is. Oh, wait, here we go. Sorry, I'm getting a little off on my uh, timeline here. Here we go. I was detained in Cairo, waiting for a boat for 36 hours, frothing with impatience, but finally arrived in Memphis Saturday morning at daylight. I jumped ashore and inquired of the drayman on the levee the news from Vicksburg. Nothing new was word. But from them I learned that some 500 wounded soldiers had arrived the day before on a boat. They were the ones I wanted to see. So as our boat was going no farther, I took my baggage up to the Gayoso house, where a year before rebel officers had reveled and boasted. There I was told I could not get into the hospitals before 8 o'clock. At that hour I presented myself before the door of the Gayoso Block Hospital, which is the largest of the 8 or 10 institutions of the kind in the city. And fortunately, uh, meeting a surgeon just going in, he told the guard to admit me. He took me to the office and handed me a book having a list of the wounded received the day before. Almost the first name I saw was a man I knew very well of Company D, Ben's Company of the 72nd. You may believe I was excited when I saw the evidence, not only that the regiment were there, but Ben's Company was decimated, as I saw seven other names of the same company. I did not look for his name as I learned before of the surgeon at the officer's hospital quarters in a separate building. I immediately asked to be shown to this man. He was sitting up in bed having his wound dressed. You ought to have seen his countenance lighten when he saw uh, me, but mine did not change till I had asked the question in fear and trembling. How is Ben? All right, was the answer. Then how is Carol? All right. Were they both in the battle? Yes. How did they behave? First rate. Ben, he said, was put in the command of Company H and led them into the thickest of the fight and acted with coolness and bravery, which rejoiced me almost as much as to know that he was alive and unhurt, 
but that he hadn't told me till after I inquired after one and another and been rejoiced or saddened in turn to hear of their welfare or the wounds of their noble death. And he continues, the regiment was recruited mostly in Chicago. The officers, most of them my personal friends, and being one of the committee who raised the regiment and have since looked after their families, I knew uh, personally a great portion of the men and, the, the, and their families, and I don't know as you can imagine how it came home to my heart to hear of one and another who had fallen. There were 108 killed and wounded out of a little over 400 who were present and well enough to be in the fight. Among the killed in Ben's company was a Sabbath school teacher from our Sunday school who had enlisted from religious sense of duty and whom I had often mentioned to the school to keep their remembrance of him as they were however sure to do as he had been in the school from its organization and many prayers were following him. Mary perhaps will remember him, Alfred H. Walker. He was sergeant in Company D. Another was a young uh, lawyer who had tried to raise a company, but not succeeding, uh, but feeling a duty to go, had enlisted as a private with Ben. His father was a fine man in my office a day or two before I left, inquiring the latest news I had from the company, and talking about his son, seemingly rejoiced that he had been displayed uh, so much patriotism as to enlist as a private. Among the officers killed was Lieutenant Mowry, who had been uh, of the board of managers with me of the Young Men's Christian Association, but resigned that place to enter this regiment. He was one of our most active members of the association, and so on. I cannot name them all, but you will see I had a heart interest in those details. As I had to wait until Monday uh, for a boat to Vicksburg, I spent the time in visiting the hospitals and the soldiers' home. I found quite a number of the 72nd in the different hospitals, all of whom seemed exceedingly glad to see me, saying that it cheered them up to meet me here from their home. Many of them I could not tell about their families, and some I had letters for, and for those that, I, that could not write, I wrote letters to their friends. One sad duty was to return Sergeant Walker's father two letters I had taken for him and notify him of his death. I visited among all the soldiers. It was astonishing to see how cheerful they all were amidst their pain and suffering. Their successes lately met with by them, no doubt animating them, but our soldiers are brave and heroic. I learned to love them when I witnessed what they were undergoing for us. Legs and arms off, cheeks and jaws shot away, body and limbs fractured and cut in every conceivable manner. I could not help feeling how much we owed them, and to all who are yet risking themselves in the same manner, and perhaps something like hatred of not revenge toward those southern traitors who had instigated this cruel war. Sabbath morning, I went to the Union Sabbath School, where there were quite a respectable number. They had rooms adorned with the U.S. flags, and I asked uh, the children if they loved the good old flag. It was quite refreshing in that city of traitors to hear them answer, yes, yes. I forgot to say the hospitals in Memphis are patterns of neatness and comfort, well supplied with surgeons, nurses, medicines, and food, the latter being well cooked. The soldier's home is a beautiful place about a mile from the river. It is a large house owned by a secesh who has abandoned it and said to be in the rebel army. In a fine, it is in a fine park. Shade trees and flowering trees abundant. Among the latter is the magnolia and the catalpa and roses, honeysuckle, etc. It is an institution for the benefit of friendless soldiers. All soldiers who can get that far on their way home are welcome to come and stay overnight or till they can send for any papers they might require to obtain transportation home or back to their regiment. When convalescent and discharged from hospital, they can go there and stay until they get strong and find good friends in the matron and her assistants. It is a very desirable and worthy institution, but I must leave other things of interest and get past Memphis or we shall have no time to stay at Vicksburg.
On the way down, we were accompanied uh, with a sanitary boat from Cincinnati. Our boat, the Jacob Strader, being a very large one and partly loaded with sanitary goods at Louisville and finished at Cairo with the same kind of stores from Chicago. We had a regiment of soldiers taken on at Columbus and four other boats were in the fleet loaded with soldiers. On the way down, we had a little excitement, the foremost boat having been fired into by guerrillas and the soldiers returning the fire and driving them back. A, gun a gunboat convoyed us past the most dangerous point, which happens to be just uh, about some uh, 70 miles below Helena. We have a gunboat now convoying us, and she, she's she been seen shelling the woods and driving back a few skulkers who were seen through the trees. They did not fire on us. On the way down and up the river, there is scarcely a living person to be seen. Occasionally a few Negroes, but very seldom a white person. Plenty of chimney stacks can be seen where houses have been burnt and but few houses left standing. It is the custom whenever a guerrilla fires on a boat for a gunboat to repair to the spot and burn up all the houses in that neighborhood and all the property about, not asking whether they are friends or foes. It is enough that they allowed guerrillas in their neighborhood. Some plantation houses with the mansion and Negro homes all about are left standing abandoned, however, by the inhabitants. Only one or two below Helena were noticed occupied, except the small town of Napoleon. Arriving near the scene of action, we stopped at Millican's Bend, where there was quite a village called Millicanville, now consisting of nothing but chimney stacks and two or three deserted houses, which, however, are being used for hospitals by the 9th and, Louisi and 11th Louisiana Colored Regiment stationed there. The place at the bend of the river uh, was named for a man uh, by the name of Millican, who was a large owner of the place and other places. Bends, chutes, and bayous on the lower Mississippi are similarly named after persons who have for years owned large plantations nearby. While here I might as well allude to a fight which took place at Millican's Bend last Sunday while I was below. A force, it is said, of 2,000 or 2,500 rebels came in to capture the place. It was defended by the 23rd Iowa, uh, who, however, uh, whoever by the many battles have been reduced to about 120 effective men and the parts of the 9th and 11th Louisiana Colored Regiments. In all, not over 600 men who had fought behind breastworks and drove back the rebels, assisted by perhaps uh, some uh, gunboats which arrived uh, as they were wavering and threw in a half dozen shells when they run. And this is an illustration of the Battle of Milliken's Bend. And uh, he went on to say about the battle, the Negroes fought with desperation. It was a very bloody fight as the rebels, encouraged by their superior numbers and supposing the Negroes would quickly run before the chivalry, came up uh, onto the breastworks and into the rifle pits and bayonets were very freely used. The Negroes, not having had arms long and not being handy with bayonets, used the gun stocks and broke the heads of their assailants. There were 147 rebels buried by our men besides what they carted away. We went ashore night before last and saw the battleground, which was still strewed with hats, blankets, broken bayonets, and guns, belts, cartridge boxes, etc. The Negroes showed us around and were very proud of their achievements and said that they were ready to meet the rebels wherever they, whenever they came. And Underwood continues, after passing the bend, on our way down, we entered the Yazoo River, which empties into the Mississippi some six or eight miles above Vicksburg, passing up that river some six or eight miles above Vicksburg. We came to Chickasaw Bayou, uh, the side of which is uh, where he made his first attack on Vicksburg last December. This is now the landing for Grant's army, and we landed here among some 40 or 50 uh, boats which lie at the shore. We had to climb a steep hill to get up on the plain, and there spread out before us was the material of war, or quite a material part of it, uh, such an immense amount of bacon, hard bread, or hardtack as the soldiers call it, in boxes, 
hay, oats, corn, ammunition, cannon, a regiment or so of soldiers in tents which acted as guard, while off to one side was Camp Contraband, where lived the black fugitives, uh, for there are two kinds of fugitives now. I asked one stout black fellow if he didn't pity his master for having lost such a likely fellow as him. He said, no, he has no use for me now. I am running one way and he is running another. Another one replied to the same question that he wanted himself probably as much as his master wanted him. Here I found a boat just going up the river and going aboard found Lieutenant Colonel Wright with his stump of an arm just protruding above his shoulder, sitting in a chair hot and uncomfortable. At first sight to me, the tears started to his eyes as, uh, his only, as he gave me his only hand, but it was only for an instant and he seemed brave, saying he was going home to get well. His arm was lost in a good cause and he was willing to risk the other. I gave him a letter from his wife and went aboard our boat and got him some ice, lemons and sugar and made him some lemonade and gave him a supply to take along with some blackberry cordial and uh, he seemed quite cheered up. I must tell you a circumstance in this connection. The chaplain of the 72nd had been home and arrived the day before the battle. Among other things, he carried Colonel Wright several pairs of nice gloves sent by his wife. The colonel, having lost his left arm, got someone to look about the hospital for a man who had lost his right arm and divided the gloves with him. I saw before I left Memphis two hospital boats arrive there with wounded, which I recognized several of the 72nd and 113th and other Illinois soldiers. These hospital boats are very fine. There is a medicine room well stocked in the front of each. No state rooms, but the whole upper deck and lower deck in one room each in which there is free circulation of air. They accommodate about 500 cots each. At the head of each cot is an upright rod holding a tin clasp. In this clasp is placed a card on which is written the soldier's name, company, and regiment, and it is so in the city hospitals also. Our sanitary boats, some five or, uh, four or five in number, had all expected to take back a load of wounded, but there was no need of it as the government had plenty of these hospital boats in readiness, which were much better. It was surprising to see and hear how well the wounded had been cared for and how quickly they had been taken from the battlefield to the field hospitals, which are large tents in some cases and in some cases deserted houses attended to and then as fast as able to be moved, taken on board these hospital boats and taken to Memphis. And this is a good illustration of uh, a hospital boat and then the, uh, the, the drawing is of the interior of uh, one of the, the hospital boats. And then Underwood continued, well, to return to the landing, in addition to other things mentioned, was seen an immense number of army wagons, which had come from the front to the landing for supplies. Each one hitched uh, to six mules, which were driven by one man who rode one of the wheel horse mules and with one rein and a long whip guided and drove them. Among uh, uh, these, with the help of Colonel Wright's servants, I found a team belonging to the 72nd, and by him I sent out a request to Colonel Starring to obtain me a pass from General Grant. And while eating supper in the evening on the boat, someone touched me on the shoulder. I looked up, and seeing Ben, I jumped so as to frighten all the guests at the table, and you had better believe we shook hands some. He had the pass, and after feeding him, we started off for the camp some seven miles out. We stopped out at the crossing of the Chickasaw Bayou, some two and a half miles out, where Sherman had his severest battle, the rebels having been posted on the Walnut Hills opposite and kept him from crossing. There we waited for the moon to come up, as Ben was not well posted in the road, and in the dark we might ride inconveniently near the enemy's works. While waiting here, we could see the flashes of the guns from the gunboats over the Mississippi River and hear the cannonading as they were throwing shell over the city into, as we suppose, the enemy's works. After seeing the flash, it would be several seconds before hearing the sound as light travels so much faster than sound.
After the moon arose, we started for the camp of the 72nd. It was a beautiful evening. The way led over a succession of hills, some of which almost might be called mountains. In the ravines and on the side of the hills, we would see regiment after regiment encamped, occasionally riding by a group of tents in a pleasant grove with a U.S. flag erected, which were the headquarters of some of the generals, or with a red flag, which indicated the hospitals. The regiments had but one or two tents each, uh, say for the field officers or for the office tents. The men all sleep on the ground. The hills and valleys are all covered with timber, and men had generally made themselves uh, shell bays, which are tents made of branches. We occasionally pass corrals, which are places where teams are kept. In some of them, where the quartermasters had gathered up stray mules and horses, which were found roaming the country at large, there would be a large number gathered. At the landing where we started, we were some eight miles from Vicksburg. We went on three or four miles toward the city, and then the road winds around our lines, keeping about four miles from the city. This is a safe distance for traveling and is used by teams drawing supplies. From this road in toward the city lay our troops. Our batteries in front uh, within a mile and a half to two miles from the city and from an eighth to a half a mile from their fortifications. They are fortified around the city about a mile out from the center. The fortifications are all on hills, some of them so steep it is hard to get up unencumbered by baggage, and you can imagine how easy it was on the 22nd for our troops to be repulsed when they attempted to fight their way up with artillery and musketry pouring down upon them, our, 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 our artillery shots passing over their heads. The forts are made of earth thrown up very high strengthened by timber and seem almost impossible to, be, impossible to be taken by assault. But General Grant says that it can be done. He will not, however, try till the, till the last as it would cause an immense sacrifice of life. There are now in front of their forts and ours, also along the whole line, rifle pits from which sharpshooters watch each other and watch the forts and hills about. If a head comes up above the fortifications, or if a person in a hurry going from one camp to another go over the hill instead of going around, a dozen rifles are fired at him at once, and whenever a rifle is fired, another on the other side is aimed at the smoke, so that bullets are whistling through the woods pretty merrily most of the time. Perhaps you do not know what rifle pits are. They are merely long ditches, the earth thrown up toward the enemy so that a person can walk in the ditch by bending down securely, but if he straightens up his head, he will show and a bullet most likely call him home. To protect themselves, the sharpshooters put up on the bank sometimes bags of sand, leaving occasionally a hole to shoot through, or lay a long log with chips cut out on the underside large enough to look and shoot through, but not discernible by the enemy. They will sometimes fire a shower of balls at the logs or bags of sand. Then the men will either stand away from their holes or the more venturesome will stand and take aim for the smoke of the enemy's gun, who will in turn aim for their smoke till one or the other is hit. Our men are now digging these pits or ditches by circuitous routes, nearer and nearer to the enemy's works. I went down into one one day, and when I st uh, stuck up my head, I was surprised to find how near I was to one of their forts. I could have thrown a stone in. I kept my head up but a few seconds, and fortunately was not fired into, but didn't dare to look up again. The men warned me not to. Not a man was uh, to be seen on their side, but we knew that hundreds were watching through holes such as I have described both in rifle pits and forts. Well, I'm a, a day or two ahead of my story. To return to our night ride, we came opposite to the camp of the 72nd and turned in toward the city and arrived there about midnight. They were camped about half a mile from the enemy's forts, or say two miles from the city, being in the front and about the center of our lines. They lie on a side hill on the top of which is one of our forts and a battery. They are there, I suppose, a support to that battery. They were all asleep in their shebangs. 
the colonel's large one in the center. We proceeded to that and woke him up and Major Stockton. Ben, being now adjutant, sleeps with them, so we all laid down together after the hearty salutations and greetings were over. They had blankets laid on the ground. We took off coat, hat, and boots and laid ourselves down and covered ourselves with another blanket. There was a fine breeze drawing through the ravine and the moon in all its splendor rode above us and my first thought was of a huge happy picnic party. The colonel told us they must sleep as the regiment was ordered into the line of battle at two o'clock as it was thought the enemy was preparing to cut their way out from the besieged city. That took away a little romance of the picnic, so I laid down and ruminating that I was indeed in an enemy's country and somewhat exposed to the vicissitudes of war, I fell asleep and never enjoyed the same more in my life. In the morning I learned that the regiment had been in line of battle for two, from two to four, but all their noise and bustle had not awakened me. During the day, having greeted the men and officers in the regiment and been heartily welcomed, I spent the time in visiting our forts which are reached by these ditches called covered ways. From one I could, uh, I, from one I could see many buildings in the city. On the way to one, I met a party bringing down the body of a man who had just been shot dead through the head in the rifle pits. I went into one of the pits and borrowing a gun of a soldier, watched for a long time for a rebel head, but they were too prudent to show themselves, and I aimed one shot at one of their covers from which they had occasionally fired, and another at a low place in the hill where there seemed to be a path leading into the valley, hoping there might be men in the path beyond behind the bushes. After the excitement of shooting was over, I began to reflect what I had been doing, watching and aiming at the life of a fellow man. Was it right? I said to myself, I thought it was. At any rate, I begun to feel the reality of war, especially as the guns, uh, i.e. the cannon at my side and all around our lines would occasionally belch forth and the rifles of our sharpshooters would crack. From the other side in return we would hear pop, pop, and the bullets would whistle by and over our heads, so savagely sounding, so snake-like, and so fierce when they struck the trees above us or the covers before us. The men of the 72nd all have to be kept close. If they venture over the brow of the hill 20 feet from their high shebangs, uh, Carol's, for instance, is exceedingly dangerous. One or two of uh, their number have ventured and been wounded, and they have this uh, discretion to keep very close. And he go, Underwood goes on to say, and he's talking about the men of the 72nd, they are as a regiment brave as lions. On the day of the charge, they all, officers and men, went and stayed where they were ordered and fought, and many of them bled and died nobly. They do their cooking in the ravine at the foot of the hill and throw their rubbish on the other side of the hill more than half as far as they can on their side, which is nearest the enemy for the balls which whistle over their heads on their side from contact with the branches on being near spent get lower there. From the description of this regiment, you can form an idea of the situation of the others. General Ransom has his headquarters on the same side hill between them and another regiment. I found him a very pleasant man socially. Though he was uh, from Chicago, I had not known him before. He is a hard worker getting up at all times, day and night, and visiting the rifle pits, the approaches, planting new ones, planting new places for batteries and forts, and visiting the pickets who in the night get so near they can talk with the rebels from their rifle pits and can plainly hear the town clock strike in the city. The generals, I find, are all hard-working men and seem to be vigilant and determined. I rode over and took dinner with General Lawman, who is an old friend of mine from Burlington, but I spent no time in visiting headquarters of the different generals. And that is a ransom that he mentioned in his letter. And I went uh, into the hospitals and among the regiments of Illinois soldiers and in fact any other. During my stay for five days I was continually on the go and the men all seemed glad and as some said refreshed to see us, to hear from the north and receive a visit. 
On the evening of the second day, our sanitary goods got out there, and as the hospitals were already so well supplied, I only sent there the hospital garments and the liquor, and dividing the balance among the well of the 72nd and 113th, which they were not slow to divide and appropriate. The days were exceedingly hot, and traveling in the roads, which are all up and down hill, and say six inches deep with dust, we could we could imagine something of the hardships of the 18 days march of the troops to get into this place with only what rations they could carry in their haversack, say four to six days rations foraging on the enemy where there was uh, anything often going without for a day's t uh, uh, going without for a day at a time enveloped in a cloud of dust so thick sometimes they could not see half the length of their regiment hot enough to roast a part of the, of the army at all times, skirmishing at five general engagements, pushing on by day and night almost. It is one of the most successful and brilliant campaigns so far that has ever been known. God grant that you may hear of the crowning victory before you get this. The commanders all feel sanguine that they can, with the reinforcements which are coming to them daily, hold back any force Johnston may bring in their rear, and at the same time hold the net around Vicksburg and finally compel the 20 or 25,000 men there to surrender and de deliver themselves up. When they uh, do not fire, why they do not fire a shell into our lines, I cannot imagine unless they are saving all for an expected assault. They could do great damage by bursting their shells in the ravines and among the hills where our troops lie. Our artillery, however, would soon knock their guns over. <clears throat> there have been many rumors about communications between Grant and Pemberton about surrendering, removing, removing men, uh, women and children, etc., but Grant's Adjutant General, Colonel Rawlins, told me that they were all fictitious. The only communication which has passed between them was in regard to an armistice on the 25th to bury the dead of both sides. At the last day before coming away, I called to see General Grant in regard to a young man of the 72nd who had volunteered as a pilot on one of the transports which ran the batteries at Vicksburg in May and who was the only one killed. I found the general willing to give his attention as he is to anyone and very courteous. He promised in his report to recommend that Congress reward his family in a special manner. General Grant, I must now say, is almost worshipped by the whole army, and I believe respected and beloved now in the Northwest above any other man. And uh, that's how Underwood closed out his letter. Um, he, uh, after, uh, he, he wrote this letter while he was on his way home, and he continued on back to uh, to. Uh, uh, Chicago continued his support for the war and for the 72nd and fortunately uh, uh, Underwood and his brothers uh, all survived the uh, the war and uh, they went back into business together uh, once the war was concluded and this picture was taken uh, uh, is not known if it was taken just before the war or just after but this shows uh, 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 ben Underwood uh, in, standing in the center, uh, flanked by his brother Phineas uh, and then his cousin Sidney. But uh, the, I hope you enjoyed this letter. It's it's a look at uh, uh, the Siege of Vicksburg that you generally don't get, and uh, I found it just fascinating. And uh, it's uh, it's a um, just a testament to uh, a brother's love that he was willing to endure so much to just to make sure that uh, his two brothers were, were still alive and were, and uh, and he wanted to take care of them as, as a big brother should. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please give it a like. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, uh, please do so because it really helps me gauge uh, the interest in the channel and how, how much content I should be trying to, to put out. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this and I'll have another episode out shortly. And I hope you uh, all have a very uh, happy holidays. Uh, thank you very much.